Today we're going to be diving deep into nicotine and its ability to increase performance in both the cognitive and metabolic domains. We're going to be starting with the neurochemistry behind what nicotine is doing on a cellular level and then kind of cross into how that manifests to a change with perception and attention and focus and also with how it can increase fat metabolism and insulin sensitivity. Here we go. So in general, nicotine is a stimulant, but it's a stimulant in a very strange fashion where it does increase norepinephrine, epinephrine, and the stress response, but it does so through the parasympathetic um, release of acetylcholine by binding what's called a nicotinic receptor. So it's a subtype of receptor on these cells and these terminals that will end up releasing the catecholamines to engage a sympathetic response. So in studies that look at heart rate and blood pressure and what you would think of with the classic stimulant, it does increase both of those to some degree, especially with novel users. But as people get more consistent or chronic with their use, the heart rate thing will still stick around, but the blood pressure will actually start to decrease. So that's a positive effect from a cardiovascular perspective, but on a more fundamental level, through that nicotinic receptor stimulation, that's where a lot of the cognitive benefits come from in the regions of the brain that have those receptors also, the downstream release dopamine and the other catecholamines that increase arousal and attention from the brainstem areas that are responsible for arousal. What that translates to clinically, you know, across the board is an increase in tonic levels of dopamine. So if you can imagine a pool of resources to be able to pursue and motivate behavior, nicotine will increase the available resources in that pool, but it does so also in a way that makes it to where you're more likely to do the things that you already know how to do well. So it's kind of like a, a trick that you could do to augment particular performances or behaviors that you're already good at to make them better or to even couple them to things that you don't like but you would like to do to make them better. So when it comes to forming new habits, nicotine is a great way to lower the startup cost to any activity that might be a little bit too difficult or out of the motivational schema for the individual to engage in. But by taking nicotine before studying or before going to the gym or before going to do something difficult or outside of the realm of where someone feels normally motivated to do something, they can use that as an adjunct to get them over the hump, so to speak, to engage in that behavior, to get the benefits of that behavior, to know that, look, when I read this, I'm going to get more information, I'm going to be better in my position, I'm going to be more skilled, or I'm going to have better muscle mass, I'm going to have what I want from a health perspective in, in exercise. At the same time, though, once that novelty is out of the way and you've, you've gained those habits, so even when you don't have the nicotine available, in the same context to be able to exploit those behaviors, the habits are still laid down in a way that makes them available. And especially when you have that prefrontal switch where you have the voluntary motivation to go and do something, it will be a lot easier because the highways are already paved to go and do that activity than it would have been beforehand without that motivational jumpstart. Now, where that can bite people in the butt is they become dependent on the motivational boost from the nicotine and they either chase the dose higher and higher and higher to get the same effect. And we see this with metabolism also, which we'll cover in a bit. But if people depend on any given source of dopaminergic stimulus extrinsically, they have to be mindful of the fact that there, there is that intrinsic dopaminergic fueling that has to be triggered by actually wanting to do something or liking the thing that they're doing. So in, in one way, Nicotine can be helpful once someone identifies that they have a habit they want to form or pursue, use it to start it, but then know I'm only going to be doing this for two, three, four weeks maybe, stop it, see how that habit maintains itself, and then only introduce nicotine as needed for further motivation, just like people do with pre-workouts and caffeine and other stimulants that help them you know, get their shit done. In terms of focus and attention, again, the increase in norepinephrine and epinephrine are going to improve reaction time and attentional resources to orient to different things in the environment. So that's beneficial in terms of ADHD and also things like depression, anxiety, any kind of mental health status where negative affect is going to be present. The increase in dopamine will allow for more pathways to be exploited that may not have been exploited without that uh, increased tonic level of dopamine. How it works as a neuromodulator in the sense of helping glutamate balance in the brain and making sure that the long-term potentiation which is behind neuroplasticity is allowed to move forward is essentially by pruning and adapting the neurons that are being fed with the nicotine to grow in a manner that is going to increase the likelihood that the pathway leading up to their stimulation will happen again. 
So it's, it's, it's a reward sensitivity in some sense, but it also makes things that are already leveled out and laid down more likely to be pursued because now there's an actual increased motivational bar to pursue them. Another benefit of nicotine use is the increase in cerebral uh, blood flow that you're going to get, so increased oxygen delivery, more nutrient delivery into the brain so that not only do you have the substrate for attentional capacity, but you also have more nutrients being delivered so the neurons can fire in a way that's actually going to generate the responses you would like to over time. From a metabolic perspective, the way that nicotine increases metabolism and improves appetite and satiety and weight loss is through the mechanisms that we already talked about with the release of catecholamines from the, the terminals that will go to the adipose tissue to release fatty acids, increase fatty acid oxidation, and you know, anytime you're moving carbon from one source to another and breathing more heavy, you're releasing that carbon as weight. There's, there's somewhat of a chronic use um, dependency where that stimulation doesn't net the same kind of lipolysis over time. So similar to caffeine, you start to lose that initial metabolic benefit from the nicotine. But since nicotine is also an appetite suppressant, there's a net caloric reduction in someone's energy budget where essentially on the same caloric budget, they're going to have a reduced amount spent because the nicotine is going to make them pursue food less because that dopaminergic stimulus in the brain is giving them a sense of satiation. So part of it is metabolic increase and part of it is a central regulation of actual nutrient intake. So essentially as an appetite suppressant, you will be less hungry, you will feel full quicker, and you will have a greater metabolism spent for the calories that you do consume. It's kind of unclear how the mechanism really works. There's some speculation that it's really through oxidative stress and hormetic response to a minor toxin that results in an increased fatty acid oxidation and energy expenditure. But the detoxification system kind of gets a, a jump start as well. So, you know, obviously when people have nicotine in their system, it will help with parasympathetic flow because of the acetylcholine stimulation. So their bowels will move more, their digestion will improve, they'll start to get more saliva secretion, and that typically ends up with improving bowel movements. So lastly, the, the effect of nicotine and the stimulation of those nicotinic receptors in white blood cells improves the inflammatory cascade that can happen across the board from any inflammatory insult to improve an anti-inflammatory potential within all individuals that take nicotine, but especially in regard to individuals that have inflammatory conditions, either autoimmune diseases or you know, people that have intensive exercise where recovery is a little bit stymied from excessive soreness. Nicotine can help with the inflammatory cascade from the white blood cells by blocking the release of different cofactors like NF-kappa B and the interleukins that stimulate a pro-inflammatory and pro-oxidative environment. All of this should really be done in the context of a professional medical setting where someone can really guide you through the expectations of how the nicotine is going to be used. They can also prescribe nicotine in a very formulated fashion with different things to help with some of the anxiety edge and also augment some of the cognitive benefits of nicotine itself by adding more things like L-theanine or caffeine. But th the wisest way to implement that would be to have a strategy set out by a healthcare provider that's well versed in this area of cognitive enhancement and performance enhancement to really mitigate side effects and the potential for you know, addiction or abuse, but also realizing the positive benefits and the health effects that the nicotine is going to be for every person in a longevity and health span.